Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models, episode 116. I'm Steve Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jujitsu approach. And today, we're in trouble. It's Kathy Hubble. Kathy, how are you doing? <laughs> oh, and you had to lead with that. That's actually my nickname. <laughs> well, of course it is. If your last name is Hubble, like there's only two nicknames that make sense. One is going to be related to the Hubble telescope, which is not funny, but the other is trouble. That is such an obvious nickname if your last name is Hubble. So, Oh, yeah. And I used to have the Hubble bubble and I used to have the Hubble bubble trouble. And I used to have the when I didn't make weight in the competition, the double bubble trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so I've had it all. Well, on that note, let's give a quick introduction. I mean, I know you, of course, as a friend and a training partner, but your resume is probably one of the more impressive ones of anyone I know. For the benefit of our listeners, why don't you give a quick introduction? Oh, sure. All right. So fourth degree black belt in judo on and off for 37 years. So that's dating me a little here, but did it in as a youth up until about 20, did the Canadian championship circuit basically as Canadian champion. I was seven time Canadian champ there, six gold, three junior, three senior in the eighties. And then of course the one masters in 2013, but as a Canadian judoka, it was quite a privilege to be able to be sent around the world for various IJF Grand Prix tournaments and kind of did the World Grand Prix circuit from 85 to 88. Women's judo was an official Olympic sport until 92, but won a couple of Pan Am championships, got a bronze at Pan Am Games. I got the Judo Canada Athlete of the Year, but I was just burned out and, and quit the sport at about 20. And uh, then I found my love for it again at uh, 45, if you can believe it, and I've been going strong since. That's fascinating because, I mean, for me, I think the main thing holding me back from judo and probably for a lot of people who listen is that I'm afraid to hurt. <laughs> and as I get older, my fear of hurting only becomes greater. So it's interesting that at, you know, around 45, you rekindled your love of the sport. Yeah, it was unusual to come back to judo at that age. I never thought I'd uh, actually do judo again. And it was kind of on a taunting dare by one of my old teammates. Of course, the women's judo team, we all kept in touch. And there was a reunion going to be held in 2012. And the only way that we were allowed to attend the reunion, we called ourselves the 80s ladies and the women's Canadian judo team. And the caveat to going to the reunion was we had to attend one obligatory judo practice and have video footage of it. So I tripped uh, over to my local judo club and the instructor, of course, I knew actually it was his son now instructing and tried a judo practice again, first time in forever and totally fell in love with the sport, just like I was seven years old again. And that's when I dedicated my whole life to it. Now I, you know, run a judo club and I've been competing on the master's circuit ever since. And of course, joined jujitsu to help with my judo ground game. And I'm a brown belt in jiu-jitsu now. So, yeah, judo for me has uh, been a way of life, but I had a, a few years off there in between while I was doing uh, stunt work for the film industry as well as um, competing in motorcycle racing. But I'm back at it, and I love it, and judo is now my life. See, that's another interesting thing, is you've also probably beaten up more celebrities than anyone else I know. <laughs> Actually, I haven't got a chance to beat up very many. It's funny because in 30 years on and off of doing stunts, I've actually only had two times where I've been able to use my judo and actually throw somebody or be thrown or anything resembling judo. It's, I mean, for sure it comes in handy for a lot of the things like falling on the sidewalk or just taking falls in general, absolutely. But actually doing judo, like only twice. And one was recently on uh, Supernatural. We had a kick-ass fight scene with uh, Muay Thai champion and myself beating up the two main characters. And that was really fun because I finally got to use my judo after 30 years on and off in stunts. So I was so excited to finally get to use it. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. So another thing too is you are one of the only people I know who is a world champ in two different martial arts, correct? I believe you're a world champion judo and a multi-time world champion jiu-jitsu. Correct, but judo is master's world champion. So 30 and up. So Oh, it still counts. 
<laughs> oh, good. Thanks. <laughs> the best I did in the world championships back in the day in the 80s was seventh at the 1986 world championships in Maastricht, Holland. And I went to numerous world championships there for IJF world circuit, basically the highest level. But I got a few bronzes and silvers and golds in IJF Grand Prix tournaments. So back then, and then I took the long break. And then of course, coming back, at that age, I was daunted a little bit, but it was like it all came back, just like as if I was a teen again. And I wanted to, that was kind of my goal because I'd never reached the top of the podium in my life, the gold medal and the Canadian national anthem being played. So I made it my mission and I, I just trained seven days a week and nonstop and those two years to to prepare for the Masters World Championships and did get the goal and got to hear the anthem finally. I was so happy. <laughs> nice. And my understanding is after you got the World Championship in Judo, you moved over to Jiu Jitsu and you've been throwing fools ever since. <laughs> Throwing fools. I love that. Yeah, I actually joined Jiu Jitsu during on my quest to get gold at the Masters Judo World Championships because I really knew that my ground game was lacking, I guess. In the 80s, we didn't do a lot of emphasis on groundwork and the Nawaza portion of Judo. And I knew that with my ground game the way it was, I needed to definitely improve that. So I joined. Jiu Jitsu. I was teaching judo, kind of judo for BJJ at the time at a local jiu jitsu club. And they said, why don't you stay after and take the beginner jiu jitsu class? And that was it. I was hooked. So I went to judo and jiu jitsu pretty much seven days a week, prepping for that 2013 World Championships. And then after the gold at 2013 World Championships, I went full on in jiu jitsu and I just got my brown the other day. So I've been loving it. Congratulations. Thank you. I can't really talk about it yet because it was the day before the COVID shutdown. So we can't uh, actually put it on social media or anything that uh, it happened because it actually hasn't been presented, but did the test and uh, passed. And then the next day, the COVID shutdowns. So. Uh, uh, uh. Well, I cannot wait to put you in a calf slicer. I'm very excited about this. Oh my goodness. I am <laughs> not looking forward to that day. <laughs> I love when new brown belts walk into the gym because I immediately try to toe hold them within five seconds. Like as soon as you get oh that goodness. brown belt on, I'm going to put you on some ridiculous brown belt submission. It's like how when someone gets a blue belt, you you have to wrist lock them right away. It's kind of a rite of passage. You have to wrist lock them. Absolutely. Yeah. It's not that I want to. It's not that I want to wrist lock these blue belts. It's that I, I have to. It's part of my job. You absolutely have to. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You as a black belt, it's your job. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Knee bars and wrist locks, ankle locks, <laughs> all those things, you know, we don't learn in judo. So it's been a, a challenge to learn all the new things, that part of BJJ that isn't in judo. So yeah. I've been enjoying that challenge a lot. Well, you brought up something interesting earlier. You talked about how you were teaching judo for BJJ, and that's how you came onto my radar initially was a video that you made with Stefan Kesting on some adaptations you can make to your judo game to make it more effective for Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And that's the topic I wanted to explore here today. And I would think you would probably agree with me on this statement that the vast majority of jiu-jitsu practitioners have garbage stand up. And I include myself in that. I mean, I am easily a white belt when it comes to stand up. And I think there's a variety of reasons why the ground game is so, or sorry, the standing game is so underdeveloped in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And I think a lot of it just comes down to what we reward, right? The reward for landing a big throw in Jiu Jitsu is really not that significant, right? You're better off, honestly, in a lot of cases, just pulling guard and going for sweeps and trying to get to a scoring position. Whereas stand-up in jiu-jitsu is a lot of work for minimal reward in most cases. Additionally, jiu-jitsu allows you to adopt this stance that would be totally unrealistic in a real fight where you kind of like squat down and you have the kind of terrible posture <laughs> that your mother told you to never have, right? Whereas in yeah. judo, you're mandated to have a, a proper upright posture. And in MMA, if you were to adopt the jujitsu stance, you'd probably just get kicked in the face. But in jujitsu, there's nothing stopping you from leaning forward in what is basically a stalling position. And that can make it 
very, very hard for a judoka to go in and actually get some throws off because you can basically disengage and just not play ball. And of course, you can always sit down, right? So there's all of these reasons why I think we disincentivize takedowns in jujitsu. And the end result is that most of us suck at it. I'm just curious to get your thoughts on that <laughs> assessment. <laughs> you know, that's kind of a generalization for sure that jiu-jitsu practitioners suck at stand-up. I've met some really amazing BJJ practitioners that are amazing at their stand-up and it's being developed a lot more lately. I've seen probably 50% of my judo club now has BJJ guys in it and they want to develop their stand-up and they're mm -hmm. keen about it. And yeah, you're right, it's not incentivized in competition. It's only two points for the takedown. And a big judo throw or takedown, of course, doesn't look like a jiu-jitsu takedown in no way, shape or form yes. because you need to have your judo takedown be somewhat sloppy judo, actually, in order to do the three seconds stabilize to get the two points. Mm -hmm. So we're not rewarded for big Ippon judo style throws in jiu-jitsu. So I've adopted what I call my sloppy judo and I would never teach that in an actual judo dojo. This is how we do this because it's it's not the, the big flashy up over your back high-flying judo throws that get rewarded in jiu-jitsu. You just need to get them to the ground yeah, and take yeah. them, you know, that's it. So I teach a, a version of each throw in judo that can apply to BJJ. And uh, yeah, some of my videos kind of explain some of that, but just an example, my sloppy Cienegi, I call it. A Cienegi exposes too much back. And of course your back's gonna be taken if you do a proper judo Cienegi, any Ipon Cienegi, Marate Cienegi, Drop Cienegi, you're exposing your back. Unless you're so lightning fast, which I've gotten them with perfect Ipon Cienegis before, but that's a culmination of many years of billions of practices on that Uchikomi, you know, practices to make that Cienegi that fast. And, you know, I've seen that happen here and there in a BJJ competition where a Judoka will come in and, and do an actual Judo Cienegi and still get the points for it. But instead of going to all that effort, basically, if you're older, you get gassed out faster as well. So why not just do a sloppy Cienegi and it's safe, it's low risk, you won't have your back taken, you won't have a rear naked choke put on you. You won't have the hooks in. And even if I, I completed the throw, if, if the girl's hooks are in me, then there's, there's no point. I got two points maybe for the take, or probably not if her hooks go in on the way over, then she gets the four points. It's actually a disadvantage of me doing that throw. So I've kind of adjusted my Ipon Cienegi into a sloppy Cienegi to just get the two points and stabilize on top. And it's kind of worked. So I do that with each throw in judo. How can this apply to BJJ exactly? And then break it down and make sure it can be taught to BJJ practitioners so that they can easily adapt it as well. Well, that's one of the main differences, I think, between judo and jujitsu, which is, as you mentioned earlier in judo, you have this concept of an epon, right? It's not just about throwing someone. It's about really throwing someone. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, you know, I, I've heard judo described as, you know, when it's done best, it should be like simulating a car crash, right? You're not just trying to put someone on the ground. You're trying to put them through the ground, right? You're trying to hit them yes. with enough force that it is fight ending force. I think it was Masahiko Kimura was talking about how when he was fighting Helio Gracie, his strategy going into the fight because he didn't think Helio would tap. His strategy was to Osotogari him so hard he'd knock him out, right? Like that's the kind of throw that you're talking about when you're doing judo. In jujitsu, there's no incentive for pretty throws or impactful throws. The throw, right. the throw can be the most hideous thing in the world, but as long as you get the guy onto the floor and keep him there for three seconds, you get your points. And this leads to hilariously ugly takedowns like i mean one, yes. of, one of the most effective takedowns that i i've seen in jujitsu is just a very simple like collar drag or collar snap down you know we had shintaro higashi on this podcast talking about how like look if you're in jujitsu maybe if you want to take people down just do collar snap downs because it's so low risk totally. right? it doesn't have to look pretty you just have to get him onto the floor and that's good enough and as you mentioned one of the big considerations is in jiu-jitsu you can adopt that cheap ass leaning forward stance where you're basically stalling from stand-up right yeah and that makes it very hard to nail a lot of throws like if i'm perfectly postured and you hit me with the seo i'm going flying and if i base out you can 
probably disengage. But if I am leaning forward in that kind of like weird jujitsu stance, then if you try to sail, odds are I'm kind of just going to sprawl on you and I'm going to wind up forcing you into turtle or I might even get your back. And that's where things get really dangerous because, of course, in jiu-jitsu, you have so many tools to finish a guy from there. It's harder to force the fight back to a neutral position. You can't just stall it out and get stood back up again. There's a lot of reasons why you've got to be more careful doing that stuff. Now, yes. I know a lot of people who advocate and say, well, if you want to do a seo anagi in jiu-jitsu, do a drop seo. And that can work, but it still causes the same problem where you're exposing your back. And it can also really screw up your knees, right? If you do drop sales with a lot of force year over year over year, it can mess up your knees. So I remember- Absolutely. I remember when I saw this video that you did with Stefan Kesting about the sloppy say Wanagi, and it really opened my eyes because you were one of the first people I saw who was actually trying to be open about like adapting judo for jujitsu. You know, I've heard a lot of other people say, well, you just need to be better at judo to make it work for jujitsu. But what I like about what you did is you just straight up adapted it. Like the mechanics of the way that you actually do the seo are actually different from the way that a seo normally works. At least that was what I found when I did that seminar with you. So Maybe we can talk about that a little bit more, right? Like a traditional Seo Anagi is a shoulder throw. The idea is you grab someone's arm, you kind of glue their shoulder to you, and you you tip over, and the act of doing that, you basically use your butt as a fulcrum, and it sends a they just go flying up in the air and over top of you, and it looks beautiful. Yes. But in jiu-jitsu, you try something like that. It's harder to do from that kind of like defensive jiu-jitsu posture that people do when they're standing, and there's always the risk of them hopping your back or sinking a choke. So people ha- come up with all of these clever ways to protect their neck, and I notice that the main thing you do differently is the way you grip. You grip over the person's arm rather than underneath so that they can't actually grab your neck even if they wanted to. Yeah, and the main thing with that trapping the arm, break that arm down and trap it and hold it tight. And then if you put your shoulder into their shoulder, you only have to do a little quarter turn. Drop one knee and you're in on the ground on top and you've got your two points. It's a terrible looking judo throw. I would never teach it to judo students as this is Ipon Cienegi for judo, but it's a perfect easy way to get the guy onto the ground, get your two points, get your three seconds stabilization. And then also you have your side control or your north south or whatever position you're working an arm bar pretty much as you're going down and uh, stabilizing the guy. So, I mean, you're right. The Ippon Judo for an Ippon Cienegi in, in a Judo match, we want to get that big Ippon because five seconds into the match, we can grip and go Ippon, it's over. And that throw ends the match. Unlike Jiu Jitsu, if I got a throw, I got seven more minutes to sit there and uh, work things for seven minutes. So yeah. power, control, execution of technique and flat on back. That gets a perfect dip on in judo. We don't need any of those things in jiu-jitsu. We just got to get them to the ground in whatever way, whatever fashion possible. And that's a sloppy sienegi, but it works. And it can also go into a koji if they happen to have their leg in the right spot. And the koji gary is the best from COA, is the best combination I find works in every jiu-jitsu competition. Yeah, like a lot of judo throws are very hard to translate to jiu-jitsu just because of the posture. But those two basically like inside leg trips, they'll teach you those in any fundamental jiu-jitsu class, even if the instructor doesn't know what judo is, right? Like they're they're very, very effective in jiu-jitsu. By the way, I know that a lot of this stuff is probably hard to visualize. So if you're listening to this and you want to actually see what we're talking about, go to YouTube. There's a video called Judo for BJJ, Stefan Kesting and Kathy Hubble. Pretty easy to find. Again, that's Judo for BJJ, Stefan Kesting and Kathy Hubble. I'll put that in the show notes, but that was kind of the video that inspired me to investigate your style when it comes to jujitsu. Now, the interesting thing I found about the way that you do this is the mechanics are different. Like the regular Seo Inagi, like I said, you're basically, and this is such a common mechanic in judo, you're loading the person up on top of you and you're using your, your butt as a fulcrum, right? And you're trying to like just tip them over it so they go flying. But the problem with that approach is the person can get onto your back or get your neck a lot of the time. Whereas the version that you do, the sloppy Seowanagi, it feels like it's more of like almost like an arm drag. Yes. And you talked about this, how you basically pinch your shoulder 
to their shoulder and then you put your shoulder onto the floor. You don't even do a full rotation. No. So you're not actually loading the person up onto your body. You're gluing your shoulder to theirs and then you're dragging them down onto the ground. And the net result is they wind up on the ground. There's not a lot of impact, but it's very, very hard to actually stop the person from doing that. And if it does go sideways, it's easy to just back out or regard or get back up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And if that leg happens to be there as well, then you take that out on the way by. You can even do a version of a sloppy CO fake and then take the Kouchi Gary. There's mm -hmm. that on that video as well, uh, one of the other subsequent videos. But yeah, there's from that position, there's so many things. And like you say, it's like an arm drag, except a little bit different with the trapping of the arm. There's a lot you can do there and still not have any back exposure at all or any risk in a jiu-jitsu match. There's about yeah. 10 more throws, I could say, you know, that, that I know really work for jiu-jitsu well, that are translatable. They're looking like a judo throw at the beginning, but after you're done with them, it's totally adapted for BJJ and it works in a jiu-jitsu match. That's awesome. That's awesome. And maybe we can get into those. What kind of throws do you generally do this kind of translation with? What are some other throws? I know Seo, but yep. other than that, what are some other throws that you've had luck translating? I believe for in sure. our seminar, you talked about Sumi Gaishi, which is one of my favorites. Yeah, Sumi Geshi has actually become my new favorite. I love Sumi. I, I used to love it as well back in the day. But since joining Jiu Jitsu, I use it way more just because of the stance of a, a person in Jiu Jitsu match is going to be bent over. Yeah, head first. Yeah, they're head first or they're bent over in some way. So it's actually a version of Sumi Geshi called Hikomi Geshi or the belt grab Geshi. Mm -hmm. And another way to say it is Obitori Geshi. So version of Sumi. Anyway, and you just grab and go. You don't even have to have the belt. You literally just, yeah. as they're bent over, especially handy if they're coming at you with a single leg, then you just take their momentum. You can either force the momentum or you take their momentum. But either way, Sumi Gieshi is one of those ones you, you can hit and it's low risk with almost every uh, jiu-jitsu match because they're coming in bent over at you. Yeah, yeah. And the thing I love about Sumi, I actually do a slightly different version. This is one of okay. the only throws I can hit with any degree of regularity in jiu-jitsu and it's because <laughs> my it's because my guillotines are pretty good so rather than grabbing the person's belt what I actually do is I grab around their neck in a front headlock and I basically go for a guillotine and I do it from there and the reason I do that is because if I put you in a guillotine choke you have to bring your hands in to defend it. You have no choice. That's so right, when you yeah. bring your hands in to defend, you have nothing to base with. So I go and I set up the guillotine. And then when you bring in your hands, I pop in and under and I sumi you. And you have, you cannot base. You have to keep your hands around to, up by your neck because if you choose to base, then your neck is unprotected and I'll just guillotine you, right? So I found that has worked very effective. Oh, that's sweet. That's a great version. I love it. I love how you've adapted it. I have to see that next time I see you. I find this is one of the things in jujitsu that you can do a lot is if you add an element of submission into the yes. throw, it works much better. Because the problem with jujitsu people is they're not only are they usually trying to stall out of the stand up, but they're so terrified of it that they just won't engage and they're always yep. backing out and defending. So sometimes if you just go for a throw, they're so ready to defend it. But if you attack a submission, they understand the threat and then they start having to take preventative measures and that creates predictable responses. So grabbing the neck, such a great example, because when you do that, it forces them to bring in their hands. 100%. That's awesome. So in general, in jujitsu, if you can grab homie's neck, like you can probably throw them however you want because they can't base out anymore. <laughs> That's just something that I found works very well for me being someone who is typically awful at takedowns. Even I can do that variant of Sumi Gaishi. That's great. And do you find as a shorter than your opponent situation, able to get the guillotine in there as they're, if they're bending down, I guess you can grab it. Hey. So for a long time, I kind of believed in this myth that like front headlocks and guillotines were just not a thing for me because I, I'm shorter, right? I'm like five, seven, five, eight ish. And, and usually if, especially if I'm in there with a huge person, I thought like, look, I, this just is not going to work. But you know, I saw like Marcelo Garcia pulling these guillotines out of nowhere and I realized, okay, there must be something I'm missing. And over the years, I've realized that actually it is completely viable for a short person to do guillotines. In fact, it is maybe preferable. Like a lot of the people who are awesome at guillotine and headlock games tend to be shorter and stockier. And 
the trick is you don't necessarily need to like grab the guy's head and pull it to the ground. You just need to create a situation where he must posture down into that typical jujitsu posture. And then you could just pop up and wrap your arm around his head. That's awesome. Lots of easy ways to do that, right? Like if I, if you are kind of like postured up, I can force a collar drag on you. I can fake a single. If I fake a single leg, I guarantee you, you're going to start to move your posture down. Cause if you don't, I'm just going to single you. So as a smaller guy, I do that a lot where I kind of go down and up and down and up. And I find that if you want to force someone to posture down lower so you can get at their head, make them think you're going for their legs <laughs> because then they will definitely get very small very quickly. <laughs> That's fantastic. Oh, I used to, that reminds me, we used to have double leg grabs allowed, of course, in judo. And I used to use a single or a double leg fake or a, mm -hmm. a single or a double leg lure basically and what you just said exactly it worked for me like a charm it was the double leg fake into forward throw they'd always go where i needed them to go to execute mm -hmm. the next throw and um i i kind of wish double legs were still involved but that's okay i get to use them in bjj so i'm happy there but yes everything is a combination that changes the game a lot though, right? Being able to grab the pants. I mean, I believe yeah. in judo, unless the rules have changed, like you cannot initiate a takedown with a pant grab. If you're in the middle right. of a takedown, you can grab the pants to like steer it and control it, I think, right? Nope. Oh, you can't grab it at all? No. Nope. Once we've engaged in newaza, which is ground fighting, then we can grab pants or we can grab anywhere below the belt. But in a takedown or a throw situation, there's no grabbing of anything below the belt. So you get a shido, which is a quarter point penalty, basically. And you can shido out of a competition match, which three shidos and you're out. It's a hansuka make, which means mm. DQ. So we're very careful about leg grabs, but it is just a, a small penalty. So occasionally it happens just from habit or somebody trying for that kataguruma and, and they just slip and do their old school kataguruma that kind of thing and it happens and it's penalized very small now it used to be an instant hansukamake there was a section between i can't remember it was 92 olympics and and the following olympics where it was a hansukamake which means immediate dq for the leg grab that's when they first brought in leg grabs and after much complaint from the judo world, it can't be an immediate DQ anymore. Now it's just a small penalty. So you have to actually get uh, three penalties shido in judo to be DQ'd now. So occasionally we hit the leg, it's not a big deal, but you don't purposely train that. So, right. but back in the day, we used to purposely train that. So, but now, you know, for example, the used to be Koichi Gary from CO Fake grabbing the leg. I just hang on with my arm up top now. So I've just retrained that particular combination. But you're right, though, about with the guillotine into, you have to do a fake, you have to do a lure, or you have to do some sort of throw first before you're going to get your main throw you're actually trying for. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work by just going in 99% of the time for your throw. There has to yeah. be a lure. And in judo, or judo for BJJ, usually is a combination of about two, three, four, five all chained together to finally get the takedown. So this is something that I've noticed that people in jujitsu typically suck at, and I include myself <laughs> in this, and that is the the art of basically chaining attacks together from stand up to get kazushi. Jujitsu people in general are terrible at kazushi. They're more like boa constrictors, right? They're kind of <laughs> trying to like slowly strangle you, and that works to an extent, but there is something to be said about the art of off balancing people. And when I see jujitsu people do stand up, a lot of the time they get discouraged because they like make one attempt with no setup to just go in for a sayo and they don't yeah. get it and then they give up. And even on the ground, sometimes they make this mistake where, you know, maybe they're trying to set up an arm bar, but they don't off balance the guy first. They just try to go through the motions to do an arm bar and they don't get that kazushi. And of course the guy, it doesn't work. So they just give up. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this in terms of like what jujitsu people should probably do to, to get that Kazushi and get some movement out of their opponent. I know it's different yeah. because the person is crouching down. Just wondering if you have any tricks or suggestions in terms of how you would manage that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, since I started teaching at my uh, local BJJ school, the judo for BJJ one day a week, I've kind of learned sort of what BJJ practitioners need for that judo movement to happen for them. And what 
judo for many, many years has been advocating to go against is the static uchikomi. And still some old school judo instructors do nonstop static uchikomi. So uchikomi is the in out, in out practice of a throw. And we'll do thousands. I mean, when I trained at the Kodokan in Japan, we would sit there and for an hour it was each knee, sun, she up to a hundred, you know, and then the next throw, each knee, sun, she up to a hundred, in, out, in, out, in, out. And repetition, believe me, drillers make killers, you know, and in judo, that's all we do. Thousands and thousands and thousands of static uchikomi. But now in the last uh, probably decade or two, they've really, really encouraged us judo instructors to stop with the static uchikomi and do it by doing line drills with movement and circular yes. drills with movement. And the only way that's realistic in a judo or jiu-jitsu match is with that kind of movement. So I've stopped the static uchikomi completely in my judo club or when I'm teaching in the jiu-jitsu club and only have line drills. You teach quickly what the static looks like, but then you immediately apply it to a line drill and you have the partners moving down the line. And then you do it in a circular fashion, that same throw. And then you have the off angle, the same throw. And then you have them bend over, line drills coming at you bent over. And then you have them blocking on the way and then you do the combination off of that throw as well. And then you have the entry, for example, an Ochi Gary kick out in order to do that throw. Mm -hmm. So the entry pre and post that throw. So yeah, you have to do with movement all of your throw practice. And I think maybe not so many Jiu Jitsu instructors when they teach the stand up, but a lot of judo instructors still do the static uchikomi. And yes, that's great for learning a throw for a white belt for the first time or for, for little kids when we're teaching. But even at the little kids level, you know, yellow belt and above, I'm starting to teach them line drills. It's harder for them to learn, definitely. But later, by the time they get to orange green belt and a little bit older, they'll already have that movement ingrained in them and it'll feel natural. And it's all about timing in judo or jiu-jitsu for any takedown. It has to be timing and it has to be exactly exactly that moment in time. A coach Gary, as he's stepping down and his foot is a millimeter off the ground, about to put all his weight down on that foot and you take that foot out, that's all timing. And you can never gain that timing on a coach Gary, a static practice. You have to gain that by line drills and circular motion drills. So that's my take on that. Awesome. Awesome. And I would agree. I mean, when I started jujitsu, we used what I sometimes on the podcast refer to as like the standard jujitsu class structure where, you know, there's a warm up and then there's some drills, then there's some rolling and the drills were all just completely going through the motions, very much like Uchikomi, right? Where it's like you're yeah. drilling dozens and dozens and dozens of arm bars and your opponent is basically just sitting there like a grappling dummy. And then as soon yeah. as you go and try to apply the technique in live sparring, your opponent just doesn't give it to you and you have no idea what to do. And it's super discouraging. So frustrating. Yeah. And it took me a long time to break my mindset of that and realize that you can't just do a single move in isolation. The, the moment to actually execute a move is like in between the notes, right? It's like in transition. That's when you're actually able to catch some success. And in order to do that, you've constantly have to be putting up offense against your opponent so that you force a reaction. If you just sit there and you're doing nothing and then you're like, okay, time to pull out the playbook. We're going to do standard arm bar from guard and you follow the steps. <laughs> like it's not going to work. There has to have been a setup to get you to where you're, you're trying to go. And I'm so glad to see that martial arts are moving past that mentality of just doing like basically the equivalent of like grappling dummy drills where your opponent is just sitting there like a dead fish and they're not doing yes. anything. Exactly. And and same at the jiu-jitsu school I go to. They've they've gone past that as well. And now it's, okay, now we've done this move. We're also going to apply this to sparring. So later when you're rolling, let's do that positional sparring, but one start here, one start there and apply that move we just did. And we do it through motion. And I think judo for sure, especially learning the, I mean, basically there's 67 throws in the gokyo in judo, but we really only use about eight and there's variations off those eight. And if you take the basic eight, if you get really good at those basic eight, or you know, in my case, I was taught, learn two really good throws that you're gonna be dynamite at and do every ang off angle entry to it, mm -hmm. every combination to it and from it, and every possibility that could happen when blocked on that throw. And then also two arm bars and two chokes. 
So in judo growing up, I had two chokes, two arm bars, two hold downs, two throws. And I think, you know, in judo especially, because we go off those basic eight and every judo throw is a variation of those eight, that's why we can do the reps and get good at. It's just all a variation of. But with the motion now, and especially the instructors, like you say, the um, instruction model has changed so much with judo and jiu-jitsu that our instructors now are letting us do it with motion and inspiring and positional and constraints-led type approach and all the rest. It's so much better now. But, you know, as a judo instructor, I still, with the white belt level, have to teach that static just so they get the idea or yeah. for grading just to get the idea. And then we put it in motion after that. Well, I think you have to teach it static at first just so that people can kind of get the steps into their muscle memory, right? Because if you can't even do the motion without having to stop and think, then yeah. there's no way you're going to be able to do it against a real opponent. So I think there's a place for that shadow drilling. It's to get it to the point where it's starting to move into your muscle memory. But once you get there, you know, banging off a hundred more shadow reps is probably not going to improve you that much. It's probably time to put you in there with someone who's going to start making a little bit of resistance so that you can actually see like what happens if he moves to the left or to the right or whatever. That's where that kind of stuff starts to get interesting. hundred percent. Something that you touched on, you talked about how you've only got like a few throws, you know, there's almost 70 throws in judo. Only eight of those really get used with any degree of frequency. And then even within that, most elite grapplers kind of narrow that down to like a handful of moves. And this is something that I think judo has on jujitsu in terms of the way they think about things and organize things. You know, I, in judo, you've got this concept of your takui waza, right? Your favored technique. And the idea is yeah. that Sort of like how if you go to get a PhD, you're going to be narrowing down your field of expertise to be the absolute best in one particular zone. And a judo game is very much like that, where you don't necessarily need to know everything. It's about having your, your A game and being able to funnel your opponent into that A game. This is actually something that I think Bruce Lee said. He had a great quote about this where he said something like, you know, I'm not afraid of the guy who's practiced 10,000 techniques. I'm afraid of the guy who's practiced one technique 10,000 times. One technique 10,000 times. Yeah, I love that quote. I have that on my fridge. <laughs> it's a great quote. And I feel like in jujitsu, people haven't figured that out yet. There seems to be this desire for quantity over quality where everyone's looking for the new, like, fancy dancy upside down angel cake guard or whatever you're going to call it. <laughs> like, there's always new stuff. I, I cannot for the life of me keep track of all of these different variants of guard that are, that are popping up. And at the end of the day, I think in jujitsu, we need to acknowledge that we you know, more is not necessarily better. You should have your Takui Waza, right? You should have the things that you are just supernaturally good at or that you've developed a skill for over the years. And then the question becomes, how do I take my opponent out of whatever situation they're trying to do and funnel them into that game plan that I'm going to kill them at, right? It's, it's not about like, I'm, I'm an ace at every single possible scenario. It's more about no matter what my opponent does, I can funnel them back into the stupid Seiwanagi, right? That, that kind of thing. And that's an attitude yeah. that I don't see in jujitsu. Like everyone, yeah. they want to be great at everything and they want to be following the trends and doing the cutting edge stuff. But like being slightly okay at everything, I'm not sure that's really as good as being awesome at a few things. Yeah, and I agree with that uh, saying on my fridge by Bruce Lee as well. And I had the same problem when I moved into jiu-jitsu. I'm like, well, I got to find my couple of strengths here and play off of those and find out all the different ways I can get to those. But as with judo, with jiu-jitsu, we have to be super well-rounded as well just to get through yes. our grading and to, in case you encounter it in a match, that you've seen it, you've felt it. And that's to me, all you need to know and then play off your major strengths. I mean, I am never going to be a Barambolo angel cake guard specialist. <laughs> so I know that I admit it, but I'll practice a Barambolo. There'll be a class on it and I'll practice it and I'll train it and drill it and I'll, you know, try to get good at it. But I know it's never going to be my game, so I'm not going to emphasize it or spend a lot of time on it. But at least I felt it. I know what it's like. But how am I going to lead that into my top control where I get into my Uday Grammy or something that I can finish her? So for me, I just believe the same in jiu-jitsu. If you can find, you know, four or five or six things that you're really, really good at 
and you find all the things like you say to funnel into those, then you'll you'll start winning matches. It's such a different mentality being a class or recreational judo or judo jiu-jitsu person or a competitor in those two sports. Because as a competitor, you're constantly looking during class to find out how can I apply this competition? And then you ask your okay, please give me resistance. Actually block me on my hip right there. Actually try to counter me here. And then it makes it actual, you know, competitive reality for us. And we have to, if our instructor isn't at the time doing that, we have to take it upon ourselves to do that with our training partners, stay afterwards and, hey, the move we learned today, I just want to see if it would work this way and with resistance here and when you counter me there. And I think that's important and the onus is on us, judo or jiu-jitsu, to do that with our training partners and spend that extra time and play into the strengths that you have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that, taking ownership of your own education is so critical if you want to actually really get good at something. And this is a mistake I made for many, many years when I started jujitsu was I would just kind of come and just listen to the instructor and just, you know, assume that if it wasn't working for me, I was bad at it. And unfortunately, a lot of instructors to this day, they still kind of discourage the asking of questions and the probing of, you know, how does this work in these situations? There's very much Mm -hmm. a shut up and listen mentality in a lot of gyms. But I think that the people who get really good at this, actually the people who get really good at anything in any walk of life, they're the ones who aren't afraid to ask questions and to, you know, challenge things to say, well, what, what about if X, Y, Z happens, right? Like how, how do I deal with that? And they're not afraid to try to adapt these techniques to their own particular situation. Exactly. And we all don't want as instructors to have 15 or 20 of these people constantly asking questions in (laughs) class, but I'm one of those that loves to ask questions and figure things out. But I do know that maybe one question is enough, but then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the um, responsibility of staying after class and what my instructor just taught me, try to apply it with a training partner or two or three and ask them to provide that resistance or counter, or I got to figure it out for myself because yeah, it's a bit disrespectful to during the class, just challenge everything the instructor's saying. I know as an instructor, I I don't like that either. But after class, I always stay after class and say, absolutely, that's a great question, whoever it is asking. I would love to explain how that could be countered or if the guy comes in left on you on that throw, how you could react or whatever. And I do the same with, you know, when I'm in jiu-jitsu class, I'll make sure I'll stay after and anything the instructor taught me, I really want to know how can this apply to my strengths. And I ask one of the training partners to stay behind and we work on it together. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that the trick is a lot of these things are a paradox, like something might be good in a lot of cases, but not always. And this is a good example where, yes, you want people to question things, but you don't want a situation where your students like you can't say anything without your students jumping in and questioning everything you're saying, because then you'll never get yeah. anything done. It's, it's the same with having yeah. a favorite technique, right? Like a Takui Waza. I mean, yes, you want to isolate and narrow down and focus on the things you're good at. But you also don't want to be so narrow minded that you're not looking to add other things to your game and to try new things. Right. So it's like a balance. Right. On one hand, there are certain practices that will make you good, but you don't want to do those all of the time. Right. There's a time and a place for shifting up your mindset a bit. And I think that's a a challenge that a lot of people have in the martial arts is they want definitive answers like always do this. But in the reality, things tend to be a little bit more nuanced than that. And sometimes the rules apply and sometimes they don't. A hundred percent. And what I always feel is for one body, it's not going to work for the next body. They might be a different body shape or size or ability or stance. So I always say to my students, why not just um, you guys show me? I'd like to see you come forward. Hayden, now you come forward, Chase. And I want to see how you guys would apply this throw. And then they, they, they show me, they teach me and show me how it works for them. And then, oh, that's fantastic. I didn't realize it could be done that way. And for your body tape, I see I see that's how that works. And uh, it opens my eyes every time and, and makes me realize, you know what? The throw that I'm teaching and the way I'm demoing it may have 99 other variations depending on the person that's executing that technique. So I love going around and getting them to show me how they're gonna make that technique work. And then it always leads to great discussions and it's the the kid or, or even the adult student that's discovering for themselves 
not just being told by a black belt instructor that's the way it has to be. So I think it's a, it's a further exploration in, in teaching methodologies, I suppose. But kids, you know what? They actually come up with the best ideas and it surprises mm -hmm. me every single time. It doesn't really surprise me because kids are not afraid to look stupid in front of the group, right? Or at least not at a very young age, they're <laughs> not. That's a, that's a learned behavior. But kids have that kind of like innocence and sense of creativity and exploration and a sense of asking why. And you lose that as you get older, which is unfortunate yeah. because that's where so much of creativity comes from, right? Whereas I know in a lot of adults, they're afraid to ask a question in front of a group, especially when they're a white belt because they don't want to look dumb, right? I mean, my instructor, Don Whitefield, I think you've been to some of his classes where he'll open the class up by saying, are there any questions? And he'll wait until there's a question. Like he'll wait there for 10 minutes in dead silence until someone asks a question because- Yeah, he, that's fantastic. He knows someone has a question. They just don't want to ask it. And it's just a matter yeah. of waiting until that, you know, the, the <laughs> awkward silence becomes more awkward than the fear of asking the question. But eventually someone will ask a question. Absolutely. I went to, I don't know where I was. I think it was in Rome. Yeah. I, you know, got on the whole BJJ globetrotting thing at one point. And when I became addicted to BJJ, of course, after joining, that was it. I had to travel the world to all the different jitsu schools in the world and uh, went about that and did competitions as well. But I think it was in Rome, Italy. And the, and the guy just sat in the middle and we all gathered around. We're waiting to either bow in or him talk or do something. And he was just like, okay, who's got stuff? And that was it. And that's all he said. <laughs> and then slowly, finally, somebody pipes up and they say, well, I really want to work on this, you know, just always have trouble in this position. And, and then boom, that's a whole class, you know, or somebody yeah. else pipes up. What about for me? That doesn't work because blah, blah, blah. And then, oh, for me, it works if you do it this way. And then the whole class is interactive and everybody goes off and tries it and they find their own way of doing that exact same move, which is so cool because every move that we teach is going to have so many variations on it depending on that person and i think everybody's got to discover that for themselves what that is yeah that's a great point because if one person in the class has the courage to sit up and say hey i don't understand this or i'm having trouble with this you can be assured that there's a whole bunch more people in the class having the same problem who just aren't comfortable saying it totally so it's always worth investing in time like that and i actually love that approach too i've had times where i come in and i you know i got an idea in my head of what i want to show and i open up with questions and someone asks a question about like how do i escape xyz and then I realized pretty quickly, you know what? That's actually a better topic for the class than what I thought we should talk about. And I wind up just winging it and changing to accommodate the discussion and the instruction to what the students actually want to know versus what I thought they might benefit from, right? Because at the end of the day, if a, a student is going to, if they've got a question, they're probably going to know best where their holes are at that point. And maybe I can help them with that versus just kind of throwing knowledge on them that isn't interesting to them or that they're not ready for. Yeah, and absolutely. And as black belt instructors, we have to go, we don't know everything. And, and it's sometimes hard for us to leave the ego or whatever you say that's uh, metaphorical. But the student that may be white or blue belt might have a way better idea of how that might be executed better. And, and we should be open to listening to that. And even if it's after the class, when they bring it up and then be open to know that you're not going to say, no, that's not the way this, this works. You're going to say, well, I like the way that you're doing this, but also, here's another way of doing it with your idea in mind there and that kind of thing. But you're right. In a, in a group, it's tough. But once somebody breaks that ice, it, it becomes so interactive and so much better. I just I never want to come across as that sort of black belt who knows all either. Yeah. And, you know, the one that stands in the, the front of the room and just says, this is the way it's to be done. You know, I might say if it's a grading situation for your orange belt, the following seven throws need to be rehearsed this way you know, like that kind of thing for a grading exam. But other than that, if I'm just showing a move or something, it'll be completely wide open to discussion and interpretation. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. And I think that that's one of the things about martial arts that we've talked about this many, many times in the past. It's easy as the instructor to fall into this trap where you feel pressured to act like you know everything, right? There's right. just an authority that people are going to give you when you wear a black belt. And it's hard to admit you don't know stuff. But we had Valerie Worthington on the podcast recently. And one of the things she said was, you're not a black belt in everything. 
And that's true, right? Like, love it. Even if you're a black belt in jujitsu, you're not a black belt at every aspect of jujitsu. I mean, there's certain things in jujitsu that I can say with full confidence I'm a black belt in, but there's other areas that I don't even touch. Like, I don't really know. I mean, I know what a barambolo is, but I would never offer to teach such a thing because I know that I've got like white belt level knowledge of it. It's just not a thing that I do. I know if someone how tries to barambolo me, how to get them out of that crap and get them back where I want them to be. But (laughs) if you want me to like turn upside down, like I got this, I've got this like COVID beer gut going on. I'm not going to (laughs) invert on my stomach. It's just not going to happen. So you can't be a black belt in everything. And it's okay to accept the limitations of your knowledge. And this creates funny situations where, you know, maybe you're a black belt and maybe your student is like a, a blue belt, maybe even a white belt, but maybe it just so happens that in this one particular move, they happen to know more about it than you do. And that's something that you should celebrate, right? Like give the guy a pat on the back, give the girl a pat on the back, you know, make sure that you congratulate them for this thing they've developed if it works. Absolutely. And I always get the demo student that is the best at that throw or that move mm-hmm. as well, you know, because I can't be good at everything. And no matter how much the students, especially the, you know, children's students, not the adult students, but look up to you and say, you know, everything because you're, you have a piece of cloth around your waist that happens to be black. Like we, we don't know it all. So I'll always say, this is the way that I was taught this throw and I'll demo it. And then I'll say, but you know what, Jake is so much better than me at this. And let's get, and he's a blue belt in my club and he is great at this one particular style of sumigashi. So I'll bring him out and I'll say, Jake, can you demo it for the class here? You know, that's not only celebrating them, but also showing, I guess, the class that you're not the be all and end all and you don't ever think that you are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Awesome. It's funny. (laughs) Speaking of which, it's funny. I mean, I was telling you, we had trouble setting up this call because about an hour or two before we were scheduled to record, (laughs) I had a blackout. And my daughter came up to me and she's four and she was saying, Daddy, did we have a black belt? And I had to say to her, well, I do have a black belt, but that's not what's happening right now. This is this is a blackout. And then she said, well, is, is this a brown belt? No, no, no. I did have one of those. You're thinking a brown out. That's not what we have. We have a black out, which is not a black belt. And, you know, she's at that age where she's inquiring about everything and it's still kind of like all muddled together. So it's quite funny. Oh, that's hilarious. Oh, kids are the best. They're so awesome. Mine's grown yeah. up, so I don't get all those funny little things anymore. I miss those. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I dread when she's older because, I mean, I know on one hand I – it's good for them to grow up and I should celebrate that. But she's just, you know, she's my little four-year-old companion. She's my little buddy and we have all these fun adventures and stuff. And, you know, I don't want her to be an angsty teenager. No. Did you get her a pink gi yet? Is she part of your club yet? Oh, yeah. yeah. I think she's actually got a pink never tie belt gi, if I understand correctly. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Great. Awesome. I feel bad because she had just started jujitsu when COVID happened. She had been to like just a few classes and she absolutely loved it. And we've got these adorable videos of her jumping around. And this was in like February, 2020. <laughs> so she, neither, neither she nor Aww. I have really been training since then. But yeah, as soon as this thing is under control, going to get her back into it for sure. Well, you can be on the living room floor with her showing some arm bars and things <laughs> during COVID quarantine. You know, we've thought about it, but for some reason, I don't have any willing partners in the house who want to practice with me, which is unfortunate. Oh, darn. I know I've tried with my husband and as soon as I put on one arm lock or a choke, then he's like, I'm out. It doesn't work. <laughs> well, knowing you, you probably tried to like eep on him onto the cement is what I'm guessing. And that was probably... Oh, maybe maybe once or twice. <laughs> yeah. That, that might have been the thing where I, I was telling people in our Discord, I remember like that when you came to do that seminar and after class, you just looked at me in front of the whole class and said, Steve... I want to throw you right now. And like my entire life flashed before my eyes. <laughs> but you were you were very gentle and I appreciate that greatly. Oh, I don't remember saying that, but I do remember throwing you. <laughs> That's great. It does sound like something I might say. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> it was fine. It was an educational moment for me. Awesome. But on that on that note, one thing I'd like to get your opinion on. So one of the things about judo that is different when it comes to how you do throws is there's a lot of really high commitment throws or, you know, in some of them we call sacrifice throws, right? But basically the idea that you have to go all in on these throws to make them happen. And if they don't happen, you're probably in a bad spot because of it, right? And you already gave an example of how you've adapted the Seowanagi to reduce that level of commitment, right? Your version of the Seowanagi, if you do it and it goes wrong, 
you're not as likely to get choked out as you would be if you went for a traditional one. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that kind of difference, right? Like I'd say that one of the main differences between judo stand-up and jujitsu stand-up is that judo requires a much greater degree of commitment to the technique, whereas jujitsu has a lot of these like lazy takedowns where you can kind of tepidly try them. And if they don't work, you've always got an escape hatch. And that's good for, you know, that's good for, I guess, your positional safety. But I think it's also probably a big part of the reason why everyone in jujitsu sucks at takedowns. (laughs) That's not everyone. (laughs) Believe me, I met some amazing (laughs) jujitsu guys at stand up. They're actually amazingly lately coming along like way more in jujitsu. I'm seeing the stand up like just in the last five years, you know, you're right. It used to be probably a judoka could come in that's done judo for a few years and and dominate in the stand-up at most jiu-jitsu gyms. But now it's they're training stand-up a lot more, just like in judo mm-hmm. clubs, we're training the groundwork a lot more. We're about 50% groundwork now and 50% stand-up now at most judo club practices. And maybe it hasn't gone that way quite yet in jiu-jitsu gyms a lot because of mat surface and or mm-hmm. like not a sprung floor and maybe their puzzle mats on concrete or ceiling height so they can't get the height for the big throws so probably it's like an 80 20 thing in a lot of jiu-jitsu places that they train stand up 20 percent, 80 percent groundwork but at least it's there now i mean when i did my little globe treading thing i went to some jiu-jitsu gyms where they just didn't train any stand up like zero just okay yeah. start on your butt that's it now I'm seeing it in almost every jiu-jitsu place I go to now. There's there's some stand-up portion of the practice, which is fantastic. Yeah. You wanted to know some of the throws that uh, oh, yeah. translate over? that you could- Give us the playbook. Give us the playbook. <laughs> and I'd also, I'd also be curious to know what are some of the throws that just, in your opinion, don't do them in jiu-jitsu. I'd be curious to know that as well. Okay, sure. Well, we'll start with some of the ones that I can like for adapting to jiu-jitsu, like the Cienegi for sure with the sloppy version of it. You can look that one up on the video there with also into the Kouchi. And you can also fake the Kouchi into the COA. So you reverse that combination. And that's an excellent effective throw for BJJ as well. There's also what we call the Ochigari kickout. So you can commit fully to your Ochigari, but you'll inevitably, almost always, inevitably end up in their guard. And which is fine. It's okay. You still got your two points. You stabilize nicely. Now you do your passing your guard if you can. But if you're not a good get out of guard player, then Ochigari getting stuck in guard might not be the one for you. The full commitment Ochigari. But the Ochigari kick out, so you just fake an Ouchi just to get their stance widened to go into a Taitoshi, a Tsunegi, a Yokowakari, a Kashigurumo, whatever throw that you're doing, the forward throw, you use an Ochigari fake or an Ochigari kick out. And it positions their body in such that not only their leg will be back, so their other one's forward, but also they've just resisted and gone forward with their momentum so you can take them forward. Mm-hmm. Almost every time I do an Ochigari fake or an Ochigari attempt, and you got to full commit on the Ochigari fake so that they will resist against and take their momentum forward. And then you just take their momentum. And that's so simple to pull off almost any forward throw if you get them moving with that Ochigari fake first. So that one I highly recommend it to practice. Any forward throw that you practice, try it with an Ochigari fake first and just get them moving. And presumably in the jujitsu context, like if I try an Uchigari, right, I'm probably going to force the other guy into a situation where he has to kind of like widen his stance, right? Is that what you're saying? Yes, exactly. Yeah. And in the jujitsu concept or in the jujitsu context, if you want to get into things like leg entanglements or to get underneath the guy, that's awesome, right? Because then you don't even need to go for a takedown. You can just go right into him and underneath him into whatever leg entanglements you want to do. You can get into things like single leg X card probably a lot more easily, I would presume. Absolutely. Yep. The Ochigari kick out is fantastic for that. Just widen mm-hmm. his stance. And if the, he does the big resistance, then you take him forward if it's mm-hmm. there. So I love that one, the Ochigari fake or the Ochigari kick out. It works well, the Ochigari kick out into Taitoshi. Taitoshi, I really like as a jiu-jitsu throw, just because you can do a variation on Taitoshi that doesn't quite expose your back like a Sionagi would, a regular one. You can, not quite like John Danaher's with the knee on the ground, but you're outside of their stance. So basically your leg is across them and you're outside of their stance. You're not inside of their stance, so they can't take your back in that 
in that situation. And it's a tewaza or a hand technique. So mm -hmm. you're steering the bus and you're holding your right hand against their collarbone and pushing on them and wheeling them around. So worst case scenario, you shove them over and you're on top. You're not exposing mm -hmm. your back and you're not going to have hooks in on the flyover. So that's a nice low back exposure throw for judo, especially if you use it with the Ochigiri fake, because inevitably they're going to go back, resist forward, and then you do your Taitoshi. Yeah, I've never been particularly good at Taitoshi, but my understanding is like it, it differs from a lot of these other takedowns in that it's kind of a distance takedown. Like you said, it's a hand technique. So you're not like going into like hugging distance for the guy. You're kind of doing it a little bit further away, which yes. gives you kind of a degree of a lack of commitment. So if something goes wrong, well, whatever. It's not like you got onto your back, right? You just let it go and try again. Yeah, you basically just diagonally push them off to the side and you're usually on top if it doesn't mm -hmm. result in a good takedown throw. So it's a safe, low risk throw for, for BJJ match. Mm -hmm. The other one I love, of course, everybody loves Osoto, but I love the hook Osoto from the off angle, from the diagonal. I think one of the mm -hmm. videos has that. You always do everything in combination. So, but if you just practice static first, the hook Osoto, that's just reaching across on the diagonal off angle and then drive in. You almost like a body drop, but not quite, as long as you have all the contact as you're driving. The hook Osoto is you hook into his knee in, step in there and, and you diagonally push the Osoto, not like a straight back sweep Osoto. I've got some questions about the Osoto Gari here. I love yep. the idea of Osoto Gari, but I've never really been able to pull it off and I kind of encounter two problems. One mm -hmm. is, I got these short little stubby legs. So I have trouble even getting my legs like to the point where I can kind of go hip to hip with the guy or get enough enough power to, to get his leg off the floor. The other problem is because guys in jujitsu do that leaning forward stance, like their head and their arms are in the way, right? If they were standing straight up, I could probably get in closer, but because they're leaning forward, I have a hard time getting my leg into contact with theirs. And I'm wondering, how you solve for that in jujitsu. So for your situation in particular, because you love that guillotine, once you've hooked on your guillotine, you're now within striking distance of your Osoto. So if you can't take him forward mm. for Sumi, you go backward for Osoto. That's what I do in your particular case because you love that guillotine. Oh, that makes a ton of sense. Totally. And same with just anybody who's got anything that works for them, whatever that throw or entry may be, the hook Osoto or the striking distance to get the Osoto usually is a follow-up. You never can just go in, grab grips, nice straight posture, grab an Osoto in a match. It just doesn't work. You know, we practice it, static uchikomi, but that's only just to learn the steps. After that, you're line drilling on the off angle. You're circular drilling. You have to pull your partner one direction long before you can attempt an Osoto. You have to have him off balance and where he's barely standing on that last peg standing to take him that last peg out with the Osoto. Drag him around with a collar drag. You could use the Ipon Cienegi, the little shoulder squeeze that I use, and there's an Osoto there. You can Ochi first, and then he's going the other way. You shift your direction and go Osoto the next direction, the other direction, opposite direction. So Sumi fake into Osoto. But you have to always have something prior to the Osoto usually for it to work, or after the Osoto into something else. So basically, you kind of have to close the distance, right? I mean, it's, I guess, the equivalent you could you could explain is like in boxing for example you know you have your jab and you use that as a distance management tool and to set up other things in the context of like an osoto yes. guard it's hard to just walk right into that you've got to find a way to close the distance first and that probably means chaining other techniques together 100 percent, exactly awesome. and same with uchimata for example everybody loves to see a beautiful judo uchimata being executed, especially you watch the highlight videos of big IJF world championships or Grand Prix, and almost all the players or just every third player about is doing an Uchimata for the big spectacular Ippon. Yeah. That, that particular throw in a jiu-jitsu sense would rarely work. You're exposing your back too much. The turn in, unless you're lightning fast, like a Ken Ken Uchimata, which is a hop hop. I know it's very technical. Ken Ken means hop hop in English. <laughs> <laughs> a Ken Ken Uchimata is a good one for Jiu Jitsu because you just have to lift that leg up to go into your next combination throw. So I use Ken Ken Uchimata just to get his leg going. That's where you just lift up that leg enough so it looks like that you're going in for the hopping Uchimata 
and then you turn it into a side sumigashi. I see. I see. That makes sense. That one is another one that really, really works for, for jiu-jitsu, for takedowns. Got it. Got it. Sasai Tsurikomiyashi, another one. Or he's a gruma. So Sasai is the ankle block. He's a gruma. That's the knee block. That's just spinning your partner around to get him in position for something else. Sasai Tsurikomiyashi usually doesn't work on its own. Are you talking about just like standard foot sweeps, yep. basically? Yep. You probably hear a lot of judoka talking about using their sasai to get the person into the position that they want them for their main throw. And often people will use sasai as their entry throw or their combination to get their opponent's body moving. And basically it's just a kazushi making throw. Sometimes you can pull it off and you can just type sasai into your uh, Google and you'll see some big high level guys that do achieve a fully pawn with a sasai, but it's so rare. It's sasai as an entry or a combination or a fake to get them to move and use the kazushi of his body to now go into your main throw. Got it. Got it. Cool. Any anything yeah. you suggest that jujitsu people avoid at all costs, or are there there are no techniques that just like never work from judo? The only thing I'd caution, and this isn't avoided in a jujitsu match, but in jujitsu practices, maybe Tani Otoshi is a bit dangerous to be practicing in a jujitsu class, just because I've seen that taught in various jitsu schools at white belt level. I mean, and we don't even teach in judo tani otoshi at, at that level because if you do it wrong they pop their knee and it's mm -hmm. uh it has to be a diagonal push not a straight backwards tani otoshi it's a fantastic throw and if you execute it well it's fantastic but in a jiu-jitsu class especially with white blue level you'll get the over aggressive guy that just pulls a tani otoshi and at the same time rips his opponent's knee off so you, yeah, that yeah. would be one to avoid in jiu-jitsu practice anyways but I use actually Tenny Otoshi a lot for a finish after I've faked a forward throw. So a judoka might go in for example an ashigruma or whatever forward throw is their favorite and that gets them digging in their heels and leaning backwards. So then you plant them with a Tenny Otoshi. Yeah, it's funny. I believe uh, Danaher banned the Tani Otoshi in his gym. And, you know, this, it makes sense, right? Like, it's a very, very powerful technique, but you're basically, like, attacking the guy's knee laterally with your whole body weight. There's a lot of things that can go wrong if you do that. Exactly. And I teach it, and once they get to the level, they can be taught it, you know, in a very gentle manner where you just sit them on your your lap first, you know, and we do it in a very step, step, step to get them to learn because they do need to know it as part of the judo gokyo, but at a higher level. Mm -hmm. But it does work in combination with forward throw fake and then into tani. Yeah, we actually banned it in our gym for a while. My former judo place that I was teaching at had a fella named Tanner and we nicknamed it Tanner Otoshi because he was <laughs> so good at it, but he did blow a couple of our friends' knees out. So oh boy. we actually banned it. And uh, so even at the black belt level, it's just, there's a lot of aggression and somebody who's really mm -hmm. good at it, it's just, it's not his fault at all. He's just very good at it. But if you're in the wrong position as the uke being thrown and it's hard randori, you could have a, a knee blowout with that. So we, we kind of avoid it in practice, but we do practice it just to get through grading. And also in competition, you'll encounter it and you, you can definitely use it in competition and in jiu-jitsu competition as well. You just have to yeah. learn the proper way, the gentle way of learning it and practicing it. Well, that, that's the trick, right? I mean, I know that a lot of places in the gym, they ban it because it can be dangerous, but in competition, it is legal. So you got to know about it. That said, though, if in the gym you want to keep your friends, and, you know, what yeah. I found has worked better is to switch to similar techniques. Like I do a lot of like outside dropping leg trips where, you know, the one where you wrap your leg around theirs and you just kind of sit down and they fall over just like a standard yeah. outside trip. I find that to be a lot safer because you're pushing the person's knee backwards. It's more yes. of like a knee bar motion than it is a sideways twist. So it's a lot safer. Yeah, yeah. the Kosoto Gary you're talking about. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. <laughs> I know. They will call it a billion different things if we're in our jiu-jitsu class, and it'll be named after somebody, and then it'll be named after somebody else. And <laughs> But in judo, that is one nice thing. It's the, the Gokyo names are all the same no matter what dojo you go to in the world. This is actually one of the things that I think judo has right that jiu-jitsu is way behind on, which is the standard nomenclature. And I've sort of come to the conclusion that that's one of the biggest things we're missing is to just have a standard way of naming things and calling them things and also having names that make sense. Like if you take any of the judo techniques and you 
punch them through a Japanese to English translator, you'll see that the name is like literally exactly an explanation of what it is. There's no exactly. weirdness behind it. It's like, you no. don't have to like Google to figure out who Darce is or, or you know, yeah. something like that. Like <laughs> it's completely obvious why the move is is named the way that it is and things are organized. Whereas Jiu-Jitsu is still very, very wild west. So I hope that's something that one day we, we settle upon. Now, Kathy. It would be great. Got a question for you. Before we tie this up, you got to tell us about the belt, the never tie belt. The world needs to know. Okay, well, it, it started when I was teaching as a teenager and I would get, you know, always the little kids class and uh, because I was a teenager instructor. And so I'd always teach like four to seven class and sometimes maybe I'd get to teach the eight, nine year olds, but even up to 10 years old. My biggest frustration with the class was I wasn't able to teach most of it because I was tying their belts. So on, always on my knees or I have some junior instructors helping, you know, down on my knees, tying up little kids' belts. And I couldn't understand why there was nothing yet invented for just young, young children where they don't have yet the dexterity in their fingers to be able to tie, or they just can't figure out how to tie, or their parents, you know, it's tough for them to learn to tie for them. So we spend usually 10 minutes of the first part of class getting all the belts tied. And then of course, two minutes later, they're all on the floor yeah. and we have to do it all over again. So. I started cutting up one of my black belts when I was about 19, so many years ago, and made this rudimentary never tie belt. And I just uh, put some Velcro together and I cut my belt up a number of different ways and I made sort of a rudimentary copy of the first ever never tie belt. I tested it out on all my little kids. They loved it. The parents loved it. But then, of course, I was traveling around the world and I hated judo at the time and quit because I was burned out. So nothing ever came of my invention at that time. And then of course I refound my love for judo again and in 2012 and I started teaching again and I couldn't believe it in that span of time. There still had not been anything invented out there that could solve this problem. So I just kind of took one of my black belts again and, and cut it and and uh, got the one out of the attic that I worked on when I was 19. And I started on this quest and it took me about a year and a half and many different versions and probably thousands and thousands of different versions with seamstresses help and me actually learning to sew so I could do my own version and not have to always bring it to the seamstress for one more little tweak. And it took quite a long time to get a first you know, sort of pilot project set of belts to try out on a class with tweaking over that next whole year and the help of my instructors and their suggestions and people in the industry. And I finally came up with a white belt that would work for little kids and it's simple and it takes two seconds. The child can do it. The parent can do it and we never have them fall off and you'd never know it was anything other than a traditional martial arts belt. It doesn't look any different. Mm -hmm. And I love these because I actually have a custom adult never tie black belt and I love this. Oh, that's right. I love this belt because every once in a while someone will comment on it and say like, are you wearing a... It's actually mostly because I tell them that I'm wearing a Velcro belt and someone, <laughs> some like a white or blue belt will say, will make fun of me for wearing a Velcro belt. And so then of course I go and I, you know, I hold them in Kesakatame for about 10 minutes until they can't breathe. <laughs> and then I can say to them after like, Hey, I'm, I'm a guy wearing a Velcro belt, but you just got squished by a guy wearing a Velcro belt and they never bring it up again. <laughs> 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 awesome. That's incredible. I love it. I'm so glad I made that black belt for you that day. I'm glad you've been testing it out. I love I love that black belt. It's an adult problem too, right? Like class is for an adult. Sometimes it's as short as 60 minutes, right? You don't have a lot of time on the mats. I have to really, as a hobbyist, I have to really adapt my schedule to make time for jujitsu during the best of times. And the problem I find is all of these like black belt brands, they make these like uber super duper fancy black belts that are like as thick as cardboard and they're yeah. so thick they never stay tied. So I wind up spending half the class like putting my belt back on and taking it off and putting it back on. And at some point I just got sick of it. So <laughs> I appreciate the never tie belt. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was invented and meant for, you know, sort of children under seven and that sort of thing. But it's so funny because since getting it out to a lot of schools around the world, I'm getting nonstop requests for adults wanting it, which it was an unexpected thing I never thought would happen. But, you know, in America, they're kind of wide open to new invention and, and innovation. And 
most of my requests come from American jiu-jitsu schools that, hey, we've got a teen class too, and everybody wants them there. Or we've got an after-school program we're starting. We just don't want to have all that time wasted. Or, you know, I've got an adaptive athlete and has one arm, and, and this is fantastic for her. Or all these different uses that I never thought would come about. And it's refreshing, even though I meant it for the under seven, you know, brand new white belt. It's discovering through, through use a lot of other applications. So I'm really pleased about that. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Yeah, I am a big fan. And hey, <laughs> if people want to learn more about you, check out your stuff, the videos you've done or get in touch with you, how can people find you? How can people find your work? Oh, sure. Anytime. Just email me because my email is on most of the YouTube videos, but there is a YouTube channel. It's under Kathy Hubble and NTB Fight Gear. So I do judo and jiu-jitsu uniforms as well as the Never Tie Belt. So that's why it's coupled with my name on the YouTube channel. So there's a few videos there about the Never Tie Belt, of course, and my and my geese that I sell. But mainly it's all just judo content or judo for BJJ content and a bit about my uh, judo school that I run and that kind of thing. But on there, you know, comment or ask email and I'd be happy to show anybody anything if I can at all be of assistance. I'm not sure. I'm fairly new to the jiu-jitsu scene compared to judo, but if I can help in any way, I'd be happy to. Fantastic. Fantastic. And on our side, as always, our show is supported by our patrons. If you want to get on board, the place to do that is patreon.com slash BJJ Mental Models. These are the folks who keep the lights on here at the show. It takes a lot of time and money to make this work. And at the end of the day, those are the people who present this product to everybody. If you join our Patreon, you also get access to a ton of benefits like our community discord. You get access to premium content and we'll narrate your roles using this tool we have called Technique, which is really awesome for providing detailed feedback. So lots of reasons to join our Patreon. Please do consider it if you aren't already on there, patreon.com slash BJJ Mental Models. If you want to learn more about the ideas we talk about on the show, or if you want to get in touch with us, you can go to our website, bjjmentalmodels.com. You can also get on our mailing list, bjjmentalmodels.com slash join. Thousands of people on there, and we send out extra content every Friday. You can pick up gi patches, t-shirts, and hoodies on our store, bjjmentalmodels.com slash store. And of course, you can check us out on Facebook and on Instagram. Kathy, thank you so much for joining us. That was a really awesome conversation. I'm glad we finally got a chance to have you on. Hopefully, after listening to this, I will at least be a blue belt in judo instead of like the white belt that I am. (laughs) Oh, it's such a pleasure, Steve. And yeah, keep practicing your judo techniques. I'll probably see you at your dojo again soon. Awesome. All right. Thanks a lot, Kathy. Take care. And thanks to everyone out there for listening to us. See you guys next week.